Okay, it's starting up now. Cool. All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, so we got to do walking, the simple models of walking last time on, on Thursday and the simple models of running uh, this time. So I'll, I'll just highlight a few of the big ideas here and, and dig in a little bit, but um, please ask any questions that you have, right? So <clears throat> the basic models that um, we introduced this time, again, uh, you know, trying, I think the beauty is in their simplicity, but the, the model we talked the most about was the spring-loaded inverted pendulum model, because again, we could understand almost everything about it. And I'll make sure to hit a few of the main points again here, but just to re remind you, this was a point mass flying through the air. It just happens to have a massless leg with a spring on it attached to it. Um, when that foot hits the ground, there's now no impact because it's a massless toe connected with a perfect, you know, ideal spring. So there's no impact, no loss of energy, but this thing will bounce, you know, like a pogo stick roughly. And what's pretty surprising, and we'll make sure we understood that was that it, it still exhibits a form of stability, right? So this thing will actually still find a self, a stable um, hopping height and, uh, you know, forward cycle even though there's no dissipation, where in the original um, systems that we talked about, the rimless wheel and the compass gate, they basically relied on dissipation to have their stability property. Here, there's some sense in which it can, it's stable, but we wanna make sure that we're careful about that. It's only like, uh, it's partially stable uh, and we'll make sure we get that. And, <clears throat> but it's a very sort of nice and simple model. Uh, okay, and then, it's actually, uh, the, the lineage was the other way. It actually happened that Raybert built a bunch of robots that were hopping around on one leg before people were thinking about the simplest models. And the, the Raybert hopping, um, sort of leg lab hopping robots inspired the simple models like SLIP. Uh, but, but then we talked a little bit about sort of the control strategies that are sort of very SLIP related, but a little bit more complex to deal with the, uh, you know, the hopping robot, and then surprisingly very similar strategies carried on to, to multi-legged uh, robots and maybe aren't that different from what you see even at Boston Dynamics today. And then the, there's this sort of beautiful continuum between the spring mass models of running and the spring, mo uh, and spring mass walking models. So um, the initial sort of view of the world was that Walking was more like vaulting, where you would be, your center of mass would go vertically over your stance leg, right? You're, that you'd sort of walk like this, whereas in running, your center of mass would go down and dip as you compressed your leg. And I think the, um, you know, the world sort of now understands that, that compression of your leg is actually important, but to a lesser extent in walking also. So, it's, uh, so I think these spring mass models are, in favor still as the sort of the nice um, way to describe walking and that they can transition to running is very, very cool. Okay, there were a few important, um, you know, general ideas that even if you care nothing about uh, hopping robots, there I think are still very, very important. So I wanna spend a few minutes talking about those. <clears throat> One of them was this, is this general notion of open loop stability that we've periodic stability that we've we've ended up with and um because it's you know as we saw it in its passive form uh before where uh you know the rimless wheel and the compass gate didn't have any control inputs and we just talked about stability of the limit cycle here the um the slip model does have a control input uh, we we made it a trivial control input where you could just trivially choose your touchdown angle and you can choose, you can, you know, as you choose different touchdown angles, you can get different uh, solutions, periodic solutions, and talk about their relative stability. So it's kind of this generalization of the pure passive stability where you can design some open loop trajectory, if you will, and ask about the stability of that open loop system. And then there are a few ideas related to feedback that we'll, we'll make sure we, uh, we dig into just a little bit too. So I'm gonna, um, 
I'm, I've waffled between uh, whether I want to use the, the chintzy, um, you know, writing tool and keep you completely in the slides or ask you to flip back. Today, I'm going to go to the whiteboard exactly once, I think. So if you'll flip back to the Zoom for this part, I get to use my um, better writing tool. Okay, so um, I want to make sure that you you understand sort of the the subtleties of the stability that we talked about here, right? So we talked about a couple of the systems in the in the rimless wheel system. We had um, we talked about the return map, where XP was some was um, the the location of the point on the n plus one in this case crossing of the return map. And we thought about the dynamics as um, just a, a map from XP on the nth crossing to XP of the n, n plus one crossing, right? In the rimless wheel case, we actually were able to get an analytical form, right? Because it was just the equations of motion of the pendulum and we were able to integrate those in, in the particular way because we only had to find the final condition, the exact time trajectory could be hard, but we were able to integrate those. The dimension of X, right? So X in this case was just theta and theta dot, right? So it's just two dimensions, which means that the Poincaré map, you know, sort of the, you could think of it living on one dimension, depending on how you write it, you either say that you either drop one dimension or in this notation, XP is the same dimension as X. And we're, we'll talk about the eigenvalue, leaving around one um, eigenvalue that is zero. So let me write that carefully, right? So the, the approximation, if I find a fixed point of the map, then I can approximate the dynamics um, around that fixed point. With the linearization right so I expect a to be a two by two matrix in this case has two eigenvalues one of them is zero because I've just you know the, the coordinate along the um, surface of section is not is unchanging it's just going to be zero. And then the second one, we said we, we found a stable um, limit cycle. So that second eigenvalue, what was cool was that the system was stable in the discrete sense. That means that the eigenvalues are between negative one and one. Right, everybody okay with that? So for the compass gate, things got a little bit more complicated. Right, we had a, a slightly more complicated robot. Most of this was sort of the same. Now X is in R4 because I had position and velocity of both legs. In a, I'm sorry, the discrete time and eigenvalue of one is marginally stable, correct? Yes, an eigenvalue of zero is marginally stable. That's correct. And, but this is, so we, the cool thing about the return map is that that eigenvalue of zero, <clears throat> just being along the surface of section, we do the rest of our analysis in the one, in the N minus one dimensional space. And the cool result of Poincaré is that if you're stable in the N minus one and you have this section, you can still say something about orbital stability of the whole system. But you're right, that, that eigenvalue of zero, you should think of it as along the surface of section, I'd, uh, Sorry, it's actually um, the map that I've written. It's you know perfectly transverse to the surface of section. I have an eigenvalue of zero. If I were to perturb it along, you know, in the uh, like this, then it's still going to come back to the same point, right? So there's no, there's sort of no, uh, the stability is washed away by the way I've defined the map because I've defined it to always land exactly here. So I only look about the stability. Um, along the surface of section, not orthogonal to the surface of section. How does that relate to the, the eigenvalue of zero? So if I take an eigenvalue in the full space, 
right? If I don't reduce the dimension of the system, if I only look on the surface of section, then I want it to be all stable. But if I take it in the original coordinate system, then I expect there's one um, eigenvalue here that is just going to be zero because there's there's no information and there's no dynamics right, effectively along this axis. Okay. Yeah. It's good to it's good to ask. So please, if if there's more um, I can say, please please let me know. Okay. So in this case um, of the compass gate, right? It was again we were able to find a fixed point of the periodic, you know, a periodic solution, a fixed point. This time we had to get p numerically, right? I would actually run a simulation, do some zero crossing detection, event detection to numerically evaluate the Poincaré map, okay? But we can still now numerically take, um, make a linearization of that system. So I can still, approximately equal to XP n. This time I would expect, I still have the one eigenvalue that's zero. The other three um, for two, let's see, for all I, I guess, I guess even zero is between there. Wow, let me write that better. For all i equals one or uh, two, three, and four, I guess. Um, lambda i less than one. Okay, so very cool that I had a four-dimensional system that was stable on the Poincaré map. Right, the zero, the only place that I was, I was lacking that stability was along the the, the transverse coordinates. But I had to give up on my um, analytic uh, form of the map. I had to do that work numerically. So the slip model was is the you know this point. I, I really want to make sure I land the slip model. Sorry, how can you be confident that lambda one is zero if p is numerical? Ah. Um, so it's a fair question. So if I were to actually evaluate the numeric, you know, if I were to take my gradients along that dimension and ask for a linear, you know, numpy to, to tell me what's the eigenvalues of the system, it would give me something probably close to zero, not exactly zero. But I'm, uh, you know, by if I had done perfect event detection, then it should be zero. So in that one case, since I know what the answer should be, I'm sort of removing any numerical artifacts and saying it would be truly zero. But you're right, if I were to just um, play the, the numerical game completely, then I would have, I would get something close to zero. Okay, so um, the, the Poincaré map for this system, we just went through it in the lecture video you just watched. Um, Right, so, so when it's in the air, the total state is just x, z, x dot, and z dot. But since um, I don't actually care where it is in space, the an analysis we do is just the, um, we just ignore the horizontal position in space. So it's z dot, x dot, and, and z. So the height, the horizontal velocity, and the vertical velocity. Okay, so if again I have um, I have my p. This time I had an analytical approximation. Based on a small angle analysis we talked about on the in the lecture um, or numerics. For the exact nonlinear version. Okay. This time, so this is in R3 of all things. So what are the eigenvalues of this one? 
That one we know because it's a Poincaré analysis. What did the eigenvalues of this one look like? Was there an additional uh, lambda zero? Yeah, right. That's the, the most important point that I want to make sure you understand is why there's a second marginal stability involved here. And it's only really that last one that actually gives you stability. And what's the reason for that second eigenvalue of, of zero? What would the eigenvector associated with that eigenvalue look like? Right. When we talked about stability of this system, it was a partial stability and it will never reject perturbations that change the total energy of the system, right? So there's one direction that it's not rejecting, which is you know orthogonal to the surface of section, if you will, but then if you were to just go in and just bump it in a way that increased or decreased the total mechanical energy of the system, since the system is completely passive, it will never restore back to the original energy. Okay, so there's another direction in which it's, it's, un, it's unstable in a sense. But what is still remarkable actually is that that last eigenvalue, if you stay on the set of, of total energy, then you know if you just leave the system alone, it will actually converge to a fixed point in that last coordinate. Uh, so this is the you know uh, I, I I don't think I mentioned it as much in the um, in the in the video of the lecture. I, I tried to emphasize it a bit when I was adding to the notes this morning, but um, people got super excited about this. There, so there's a there's a the world of people that make these. Um, that, that sort of pushed this literature forward. It's really interesting, right? It's got some people that are biomechanics people, there's some robotics people, and then there's some sort of nonlinear dynamics, theoretical mechanics kind of people in there. And the people that came from the more theoretical mechanics got super excited about this, um, this idea that a system that is Hamiltonian, in, in, in this case, um, you know, it's Hamiltonian in the sense that it doesn't add or remove any energy in the system, it's energy conserving could exhibit some form of stability. That was a, that was a curiosity, um, right? That needed further study. And the, you know, so the, the essential element of this is that even though it is Hamiltonian, there is a change of coordinates in the middle, which uh, makes it uh, piecewise Hamiltonian. And, and people, um, you know, identified that piecewise, that, that those reset maps as being the the mechanism that allowed a system to have more stability than you'd expect from just a, night, a simple Hamiltonian system. So um, yeah, this is partial stability of a piecewise Hamiltonian system. Okay, so, but what's super interesting is that you can take those gradients um, uh, numerically. You could do it a couple of different ways, right? You could do it with finite differences over multiple simulations. You can also do it with like the trajectory calculations we did, right? We've, we've understood how to take long-term gradients with um, through our trajectory, like our adjoint operator, right? So you can integrate the, the incremental gradients along the entire trajectory to get the total gradient with respect to the map. Um, you have to make sure that you do a little extra work, which we'll talk a lot about in the in next week's lecture to to um, project if, if there's a, if you over a fixed amount of time don't and exactly on the map there's an extra term in the gradient that projects you back to the map but it's but we basically know how to do it. Um, uh, very well with analytical gradients or with numerical gradients. Um, and what's interesting about that is that puts you in a regime where. So this map, the slip map, uh, there's one other important feature that I wanna add is that this is also a map that is um, control dependent, if you will. Right, so I can change the location of the fixed point, even the, the eigenvalues of the, of the fixed point based on my decision on what my touchdown angle is, right? So and I, I just gave one example of the, of a touchdown angle that gave you some stable fixed point and an unstable fixed point. 
but the, I can change that that amount of stability by choosing the, the control input. And more generally, you could optimize that if you wanted to use this the gradient, you know, the the eigenvalues of your return map as an objective and an optimization. You could people do try to optimize. They'll do like optimal control or trajectory optimization, let's say. Um, for open loop stability to maximize some metric of open loop stability. And that's a pretty cool idea. Um, you can really do some uh, people, you can find qualitatively different solutions just by asking your system to be an open loop stable. And the extreme case of that, I hope I said it well enough in, in the lecture was this example, even on the slip where you can have a blindfolded slip model that's just swinging its leg through some trajectory. It doesn't know where the height of, where exactly the terrain is on any step, but it can have the, you can run through an open loop script that will move the leg through a trajectory so that whenever that it happens to hit the terrain, it will be sort of exactly the right place to put it back up into the um, desired hopping height. So, so there, I think that's a very, very cool example. I mean, more generally, this, this happens a lot um, in other, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's more general than walking. So people talk about it in manipulation, for instance. They talk about choosing, um, you know, open loop stable grasps, for instance. Some grasps will naturally be more stable if I'm trying to, because I always have a mug on hand these days, right? So, sorry, I only have one prop, but, you know, it might be that a, a, some grasp that's kind of an enveloping grasp if I'm a little off, um, you know, if the, if the state of the system is not my desire, my original intended state, I, can, I might still passively uh, stabilize and end up with a stable grasp, right? And, and choosing as a design criteria when you're doing trajectory optimization or planning something that's going to have some open loop stability properties, uh, it can be a very good idea. And it can, it, I think there's a, there's a handful of very cool examples in, um, in legged robots that, that I'll tell you about in a minute. Questions about um, sort of the the basic stability analysis of these of, of these kind of models, right? The rimless wheel, slip. Um, I'm I'm still a little confused, like in what sense the um, the the last example is stable, like right. I get if I guess if I kicked it in such a way that I didn't add energy to the system, what is what is the notion of stability? Mm -hmm. No, so um, so okay, it is it is it is stable in the manifold where the energy is constant, right? So that okay, I can totally see your perspective saying that that's a you know why why highlight this this kind of um, one axis. And, and say anything about stability, but the, so if I just simulate the system from different initial conditions, right? Uh, if I lock the energy, but, but I choose different initial conditions, then it will, you know, I look at it later, it will be on this same stable, stable limit cycle. In that sense, it really is like converging initial conditions to, um, you know, to, to a nominal trajectory in the way that we like to think of with stability. So the disturbances are a different kind, you know, a, it would be hard to disturb it in a way that exactly added no energy. So if you think about external disturbances, the notion of stability is kind of um, more forced. But if you think about just really, every time I simulate this thing, it's gonna end up doing the same thing. Um, that is, you know, and it'll be numerically robust to that. Uh, that is, I think, a, an interesting type of stability. I think more generally, if you had a piecewise, um, you know, if you had many state variables and you had a, a piecewise holonomic system that exhibited this sort of stability, you'd like all of, you know, uh, you'd have exactly two eigenvalues that were these had this marginal stability, and the rest could be stable, right? So, um, if you have, a, if I have only one, it doesn't look that impressive, I guess. But if I have all but two, that does that. Then maybe that's more impressive. If if it's like, you know, if n is big, then all but two sounds pretty good.
Okay. There were a couple of really important ideas um, from control that happened too, right? So uh, that are again, slightly more general. So this idea that you could design open loop stable motions is I think a general idea that we, we can ex explore. Um, there's even a generalization beyond that of, of trying to do um, uh, when you have uncertainty in the system, like per, um, limitations in your sensors, if you're partially observable, an extension of this might be something that does, you can choose actions that are informative, right? So the people do belief space planning where you could have an open loop trajectory that tries to gather as much information as possible so that you feed your sensors. And that's kind of even a further generalization of this notion of designing open loop stable systems. You could do um, information gathering planning, but very similar criteria. <clears throat> um, but, then, but then there's this extra notion of, of how do you do the feedback? Because open loop is again, sort of very limiting, I guess, right? So one idea that's come up here that's a general idea here is deadbeat control, right? So discrete time systems, right? Um, discrete time systems can actually have the property where they converge in a single time step in the, in the extreme, right? And so for the rimless wheel, I'm sorry, for the um, slip model, we talked about choosing, having a control decision that was made once per step. You get to an apex, you choose your leg angle. So on the very next hop, you're exactly at the desired height. And that's a type of feedback that, um, that is stronger than, than we expected before, right? So um, it, the convergence is just bam, one shot. Deadbeat more generally, um, you can you can have a deadbeat system that will uh, con converge in a sort of finite amount of time. Sorry, I don't know how to turn that off easily here. Um, uh, so, but you have a discrete time system if you have, let's say, uh, a system that is controllable in n dimensions, you might expect it to be able to converge exactly to zero in n steps. Uh, you could do it in less than n steps, but if the system is controllable, you can guarantee that there exists a control tape of length n that will get you to the origin. Uh, so that's a very general idea. And it's a, a system, it's, a, it's an idea that we don't see in certainly continuous time linear feedback. For nonlinear systems with nonlinear feedback, you can drive a continuous time system to the origin in finite time, potentially, um, but th it happens very naturally here in the discrete time systems. Uh, <clears throat> so this is sort of a finite, time response more generally, or finite time stability. But um, that's of course, and we, we, your questions last time got us started talking about this a little bit, but uh, it's interesting to compare and contrast that to a more continuous feedback. So, so this is a regime where uh, we're thinking about the feedback system making, let's say, a decision once per apex in this in the slip case, or once per footstep. If, if, if we're thinking about it more generally, like this, so the question would be, uh, you know, how does how effective can making decisions once per step be compared to, for instance, a continuous feedback law that's that's making decisions at every instant in time throughout the trajectory? It's kind of updating its decision making throughout the trajectory. Uh, you would think naturally that if you, you know, because it's clearly more expressive, that being able to make updates to your decision based on information throughout the trajectory should be a lot better. Um, and it, and it, I, theoretically, it's only better to do that. Um, but I think uh, you get farther. I would say I was surprised by how far you can get with the one step, once per step kind of feedback. And I think if you look at walking robots in particular, walking people, walking animals in particular, um, there are fundamentally discrete decisions about where you place your foot, which can have such a big 
stabilizing effect that they really, and they really feel they are more fundamentally uh, once per step kind of decisions. You know, you kind of plant your foot, you stick with it, you modulate your forces a little bit during the step, but I think step placement is a particularly strong um, heuristic for a very strong mechanism for feedback. In legged robots. Maybe a dominating stable stabilization approach. It's not the only ones, but it's, it's interesting that people have gone through and looked at biological data even and said, you know, like what is the re relative role of like adjusting the height of my center of mass during a, a, a step? And it seems you, you could be more stable, you could be more efficient potentially if you did some of these things, but it seems like that effect is relatively small compared to just putting your foot in a different place. And if you look at explaining variability in human data, it turns out that foot placement is a good description of our sort of stability. Okay, let me flip back to the slides here. I've got some other. Okay, so um, grow forward from these very simple models that we've we've had. People do. I mean, this is like still you know sort of simple linkages, but this is just trajectory optimization to find an open loop trajectory uh, for a more complicated model. Um, that's kind of you know take our compass gate, our need compass gate, keep growing it up, right? Just do the same kind of numerical methods that we're we're studying here, and we'll talk about. The details of the of the impacts and the like for the numeric methods next time, and you can really get to pretty complicated uh, motions. Just to, to play it again, I think this looks incredibly uh, realistic, right? And the objectives were more physics based about energy consumption and, and things like like this, and it, very very nice motions coming out. People have, um, in fact, Mumbar Kacha, who's a uh, who did some of this work, her thesis was actually about open loop stable optimization. So putting in, doing trajectory optimization with, um, with the stability as an objective, right? So open loop stability as an objective. Uh, but my favorite example actually of optimizing open loop stability is in this, oh, the video wasn't playing earlier. I thought it was gonna get better. Uh, shoot, I, I have it in the next lecture, but we have, there's a great example of a robotic ostrich fast runner that is that runs open loop stable, and um, it's just sort of incredibly um, beautiful that that all of these springs and dampers and everything. Oh, there it goes! Oh, look at that. So um, yeah, so this is just a crazy, completely passive mechanism, physical mechanism with springs, damps, and clutches and stuff like this. But remarkably, if you put this into a big simulation, and um, I mean, sort of, I say remarkably, thinking about it mathematically, but actually the, the people who designed it actually felt that uh, it had to be the case. And they and you'll see, I talk in the trajectory optimization part about this sort of stable running of a robotic ostrich uh, based on open loop, open loop stability over rough terrain and everything like that. And this is, a, you know, just a, what kind of a simulator is this in? I'm sorry, I missed when, when that when you said that. So which uh, the, oh, the, the 3D running, uh, that was Katja's simulator, the point mass one. The second, the fast runner was hardware. So I'm guessing it was, uh, and so that was an older simulator. I'm not exactly sure, probably her own. She worked at the Heidelberg group. They had a very good set of tools. I'm, <clears throat> Okay, this is actually a, a, just a, a snapshot from a, bio, a biomechanics paper, okay, where they were really um, analyzing step-to-step -step variations in human running. And they found, in fact, I, they made a connection back to, to Mark Raybert's work. They, they, they felt that the data that they, and the analysis that they did on human variability, which was largely described by, you know, where stabilization effects were largely described by changes in foot position, and actually very simple um, recovery motions at the center of mass. They kind of said like, you know, if we had done this before Raybert, maybe it would have just, it would have inspired Raybert or something. <laughs> it was kind of a backwards uh, argument, but it looked very sort of Raybert Hopper-like 
and it's coming right out of the data for, for human uh, motion. So the decision about where you choose your, to put your foot really does feel like sort of a once per step uh, decision. And it takes you into this very, dis, you know, this um, different sort of feedback regime than the continuous thinking, right? Maybe just to say it super explicitly, like the reason you don't think about footstep location as being a con uh, continuous in time decision variable is because once you put your foot down, it sticks, right? And friction prevents, it makes it so you don't sort of make small changes to your foot position while you're while you're operating. That's when you, if you pick it, you pick and you stick with it, I guess. Um, Right. And the relative role of ankle torque, center of mass variability and stuff like this is present, but maybe smaller. And I think only a few laws about the center, the way you move your center of mass actually describe a lot of the remaining variability and stabilization. It's a different way to think about control, I think. Any questions about that? Uh, yeah. Uh, do you have any examples of robots that have some sort of like soft components that maybe also help out in having this sort of like passive function? And how would that be? Good. So let me make sure I, um, so there's a bunch of different ways softness can change the game. Um, I don't think of it as changing the discreteness of the footstep decision, um, even though, yeah, I mean, contact can, can be made more gradually potentially, but, um, so what, in what way are you thinking about softness, uh, in this context? I can, I'm, I love thinking about it and I'm happy to, to push that in any direction, which, which way are you thinking about? Um, maybe in the manipulation context, like there might be a, yeah, fingers that are rigid, but maybe the joints are quite soft and compliant. Yeah, compliant. I see. Okay, good. Right. So that's a actually a really, really good example. So, so when people talk about open loop grasping, uh, there's a big thing. It's actually called under actuated hands, right? Um, where people will tend to, to make hands soft or it doesn't actually even necessarily need to be soft but a lot of times they will have just unactuated degrees of freedom or things that have that have um let's say cables that will, will couple degrees of freedom so that when you close it sort of passively deforms around the object and that is i think very much a way to do um, open loop stability and uh I would say that the analysis there hasn't been as um, thorough or the, you know, I, that's what I, I, I've always, uh, I, even though I think a lot about manipulation these days, I still like presenting in underactuated the legged robots first because the models are sort of crisp and simple and I, they capture a lot of the ideas. Manipulation, I think uses these same ideas, but it's, it's just messier because you're like trying to pick up varieties of objects and what makes a good open loop hand is just not as, um, clear. It's also about like finite time things. You can't talk about stability in the same way. But you're absolutely right. Um, I, th I think the reason that you that an underactuated hand is a good idea is because it's somehow um, achieving open loop stability, right? And softness can um, can influence that stability, right? It doesn't. So again, you can have a rigid hand with tendon driven joints or something that can make pretty good contact. But softness tends to increase like the area of contact in a, in a good way. Um, so you get more friction and, and the like, um, and you distribute your force over, over a surface. And no robot actually, if, if you look anywhere that a robot's intended to make contact, it always has some pad or some amount of softness, whether it looks like Baymax or not is a separate question, but they, but almost always there's like rubber um, between any place on the robot that you expect uh, that you, you that you expect to touch the world, 
and things go pretty badly if you if you hit metal on on the on world uh, so was that what you had in mind book it uh, thank you yeah I, I had a hard time thinking about an example in like the context of or locomotion so uh, I, I'm happy with that People have done soft locomotion, right? So there's there's um, things that I've seen uh, inchworm looking uh, locomotion. I've seen, um, you know, uh, maybe one of the cooler ones is this is a sort of apparently there's a type of caterpillar that will actually um, roll itself up in a ball and it can actually shoot. Uh, it can accelerate itself very quickly by sort of you know large deformation soft robotics. I would say. Um, so there's definitely things like that. Uh, and there's, of course, there's people have made soft legged robots. Um, but I think in the legged case, the softness isn't contributing to the stability in, in, in the same way. It's more like I can make a walking robot that I can accidentally drive, drive over with my car and it keeps working. I guess you could, I would call that robustness, not stability. Yeah, I got it. Gotcha, thanks. Sure. Okay, well, um, I continue to push um, more and more changes into the notebook to try to make sure all these notes are, are written up. I, if you have any feedback on that or what's most useful for your projects um, and or whatever, but I've been, you know, I, I've been trying to, to push as much as I can in here. Um, so I hope that is useful. And let me, um, Let me put up a survey, which I haven't done before. And I wanna just say a few administrative stuff to, to wrap up here. So the midterm, everybody's taking the midterm now, even though even the people that had some uh, extenuating circumstances. So we're almost done and we're almost done grading them. And we will, we hope to have our um, the grades available for you hopefully tomorrow, uh, that's our plan. Tomorrow also uh, your, you have your uh, project proposals due. Where I've super enjoyed uh, any, all the ideas that have been coming over Piazza, uh, feel free to keep asking us and looking forward to seeing what you've proposed tomorrow. Um, we had a piece set that's gonna, we're gonna do our level bus to release tomorrow. And we, uh, we realized that there is a, a long weekend, you know, coming up next week. So it felt a little unfair to have it uh, released on Wednesday and due on Wednesday, given the longer weekend. So we're gonna make it a little, and we also really wanna make sure that you transition into thinking about your project. So we're gonna make this piece a little bit lighter and have it due the following Friday to make sure we don't destroy your um, your, your weekend. Uh, so hopefully that's good for everybody. And uh, yeah, of course we take any questions or feedback on that kind of stuff too. I had a question about the product proposal. Sure, yeah. I was just curious how much after pose if we wind up kind of, I guess there's how much divergence do you see between what's proposed and what actually winds up being presented if you have a problem, but you wind up changing what platform you evaluate on or something like that? Oh, good. Okay. So um, yeah, I, I, I think it's fine if things change, but the exercise of writing the proposal of thinking it out is extremely worthwhile, right? So, so um yeah, I, I don't worry about things changing, but but I would say don't use me saying that as an excuse to not think through what you want to do. There's a, there's a few like key ch chances where we can really give you effective feedback, and so you should hopefully take advantage of that as much as possible. You know, the the farther you get in your thinking, the better our feedback can be. 